Excellent. So, welcome to the uh, game investment panel, and uh, we're here with a couple of our uh, wonderful panelists who are in from out of town. Um, this includes Carl Muth, who's on the end there. Uh, Carl is a uh, he was a co-founder of a media company uh, from day one to exit. Um, went through fundraising and many other stages. Uh, he served as CEO of a number of companies. He was a mentor with Microsoft Ventures for a number of years and uh, specifically watched the challenges of indies playing in the console space. He has uh, been a limited partner, he is a limited partner in six VC funds plus a variety of direct angel investments and things like that that he's been through over the years. And he's an investor in a local game studio here uh, which hopefully he'll, uh, he'll talk a little bit about later. In addition to that, he's been a TED speaker, he's a PhD in economics from London School of Economics and a lecturer at Northwestern. And he's, uh, among VCs that I personally know, he's probably the most passionate, hardcore gamer that I've met. He like knows everything about, you know, every game practically that I talk to, about, talk to him about. Um, and, uh, and that, I think, lends him a particular uh, lens through which to see the game industry. Uh, Paul Bragill here, longtime friend of mine. Uh, he's taken multiple companies from founding through exit, uh, including running a successful game studio. So he actually ran a game company, which is relatively rare within the VC community. Um, he also founded one of the first accelerator funds, IO Ventures, uh, right after Y Combinator. He's gone on to create a wide variety of funds in the game industry, uh, some as high as $60 million, uh, including several of uh, funds that are specifically directed to games and game adjacent technologies such as VR and AR and the like. He was also an early investor in Unity, uh, Resolution Games, Tommy's company, and other famous companies like Uber. So uh, I am the uh, founder of Guild Software here in, in, uh, over in Milwaukee. Uh, we're MMO developer for the last 20 years and, uh, and I was one of the organizers of this conference and wanted to bring together the perspectives of these two gentlemen on, uh, on investing in the game industry. So just to kick things off as an initial question, uh, it's often said that uh, investment choices are more about the team than the product. Uh, what are you guys looking for in a team and how can the nature of the team be most effectively uh, communicated to a prospective investor? Uh, go ahead, whichever. I guess I'll start. Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, so I say almost all my investments are team-based. Um, my LPCs should hate that because I'm like, what's your fucking thesis? I don't have one. I believe in people, right? Um, so I mean, there's a couple ways, right? One, obviously, if I know somebody for a while, um, you kind of build a relationship. That's really easy. You're gonna be like, okay, cool. I know who you are, and I, I like, you know, I like where you're kind of going or where your target is. Then you invest, right? Um, the other one's like, you know, through really strong referrals, right? So if somebody sends a guy I trust or I already had invested into, him especially, and they send me a company and they're like, hey, Paul, check these guys out. I'm gonna look way more deeper at that, right? Um, and then, I mean, there are like the randoms, you know, where somebody just comes and approaches me at a conference or cold emails me, right? I mean, we do look at everything, not very highly everything, I'll be very honest, right? But sometimes people can wow us, right? Um, one, either they have like a spectacular background, they work on some really cool titles, um, they were early involved in some company that became really huge, uh, et cetera, right? Or like other specific things, like, okay, they're totally, you know, unknown guys, but like they somehow have an advisor who's some like really fitness guy, like, wait, How'd you get that guy, right? Like, or how'd you surround yourself with these people, right? So you're looking for like, these little nuggets that kind of make you pop, right? And that's just the beginning of the conversation, right? And then from there, we're gonna talk, we're gonna dive in deeper. And then a day, like, do I like you guys or not, right? As in like, okay, you, you, you fulfilled all these kind of like idle stuff, like, do I wanna have a beer with you, right? Do I believe that you are the person that's gonna pull it off, right? And like the VC game, especially on the really early stage, you know, when you're putting money, you know, like under a hundred million dollars, you know, a couple hundred K here and there, it's really about, hey, do I believe this person is gonna figure something out, right? Are they gonna go out there and work their asses off, not give up? Are they gonna be able to go out there and recruit people too? Like, do you have the charisma to take people in? It doesn't have to be charisma like, you know, being loud, but like maybe even the way you present yourself, the way you have a vision is something that attracts people, right? So um, I guess that's it. Cool, yeah, great. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think, um, I think I look primarily for persistence. I've never seen a software project that goes as planned. Uh, you know, the 90-90 rule is real. Um, and I, I think having somebody who maybe doesn't cast himself or herself as CEO, but really recognizes that the initial role is much more of a project manager role, um, having some realism around that, I think 
goes a long way. Somebody who wants that CEO business card and isn't willing to make sure the fridge is stocked doesn't really add much to the company at an early stage. Um, the other thing I'd say is, you know, investing in games is it's like investing in films, which I also do, uh, or investing in other media properties. Um, you have to believe that it's going to be popular, right? In the end, there's it is a popularity contest. In the end, how many you know how many titles you release, how many copies you sell, has to do with whether people like it. So having somebody who, you know, really has the budget figured out and is going to make the budget last two years by eating ramen in mom's basement or whatever, that's fine, but that person doesn't have a good sense of the market or what people are going to pay money for. Um, so having, having a sense that they're persistent and having a sense that they know what the market's doing, they know what's popular is, is really important. So Carl, jumping off from your point about popularity, uh, for a lot of VCs in the last couple of years, it seems like it's an increasingly important litmus test for somebody to be able to pass through a rewards-based crowdfunding stage like Kickstarter or something like that. What are your, uh, your thoughts on that as a way of validating prospective startups and you know, should, should every potential game startup be looking at doing something like that or is it kind of a fit to different style? I think people hype, I think people hype crowdfunding as something new and like crowdfunding is not new, right? I mean, game companies have been taking pre-orders since the early 90s, and that's basically crowdfunding. Um, yes, I think it's important to have a signal that people are excited, but even the big guys get signals wrong, right? I mean, whether it's Yoshi's World or Final Fantasy VIII or Hitman Absolution, or I could list a billion well-franchised, popular characters, great platform titles that sold, I don't know, 20% of expected sales. So. That alone isn't enough, and people want to see some proof. And Kickstarter is one way to get proof. Uh, part of my investment in Skyship was I, I was impressed. You know, they filled a seventy-five thousand dollar Kickstarter in a couple days, and that's proof that people are at least interested in the project. At the larger scale, I mean, uh, the BattleTech twenty twenty Kickstarter I found hugely impressive. Uh, I ended up not investing in those guys, but I did fund the Kickstarter, um, and that. I mean, that's crazy impressive. You get $2 million worth of pre-orders based on really a five-person team and some concept art. I mean, that's very impressive to a potential investor. Um, so yeah, I, I think it helps the confidence level. But I, I would not say it should be a, pre a prerequisite. I think there are lots of investment-grade companies that are not raising money on Kickstarter. Paul, do you have any thoughts on the whole kind um, of crowdfunding thing? One way I mean, or I think it's cool. Um, I'm an advisor for Trump Big, which does kind of, you know, crowdfunding for some of the games. Mm -hmm. um, but of my portfolio companies, I have over 90 in the game industry. I don't think any of them got started initially. Right. Like, I did not invest in them, you know, ahead of, I did it for my D4, and then maybe launched Kickstarter afterwards or some kind of crowdfunding venture. Then. But your investment wasn't contingent no, on, on the, right, the appearance of popularity. Sure, sure. Came in. So, um, no. But I mean, like I said, I, I skew very early. Right, so I'm not like you know a guy who's writing a three million dollar check or ten million dollar to a company. I'm going out there putting a couple hundred k, sometimes even as low as twenty five k, right? Um, so yeah, it's, it's a little different. I, I, I have to just believe in the people. They have, they have a good vision. They have, you have to do it for a good pacemaker, right? And then yeah, then they go kind of take it to the next stage. So when it comes to things like Fig, which is a, an interesting other point, like Fig is a, another crowdfunding medium, more or less, where people can can invest uh, a la Kickstarter, but actually gain back equity from whatever it is that they're putting in. Uh, and a lot of this has been, been made possible by the JOBS Act. Um, FIG is pretty cool, and then there's, there's other ones, Seed Invest and things like that that are doing kinds of similar concepts. Yeah. How do you think uh, that's gonna potentially change the playing field for game startups seeking investment and things like that? I mean, I think any platform that brings money to the game industry is awesome, because most VCs are fucking hate the game industry. They're scared of it, right? And so it's gonna be upon, you know, People who believe in the industry to continue funding it, be it you know, people like myself or ourselves, right? Or people that you know, play the games, right? If you could bring money into the system, I think it's awesome. So the more of these platforms, the better. Obviously, you don't have a lot of noise and have 50 different platforms and everyone's competing. But think about it, it's like maybe like 100 or 50, 100 years ago, I mean, there was the New York Stock Exchange, right? 
and there was NASDAQ, and there's all these alternate exchanges, right? Um, this is the same thing. It's like building a new exchange, right? And so some of these you know, laws are getting looser, which is great, and you know, there will be winners, right? And somebody will become the New York Stock Exchange. There'll be a NASDAQ version back at Point Game. I mean, lots will be a thing. And there'll be like the next segment. Uh, Who knows in time? <laughs> and, and also, you know, I mean, like these platforms will kind of define what game is. Some platforms awesome at doing you know, RPGs. Some other platforms good at doing mobile, you know, free-to-play games. I don't know, right? So. What, one of the biggest problems, I think, with, and one of the reasons it's hard for game companies to find investment, first of all, is studios start and shut down all the time. So the track record isn't great. It's not like in the film industry where you can look through a portfolio of 20, 30, 40 feature films that a studio has been involved with. Um, and the, the other thing that I think is particularly hard, specific to the game industry, is there's, there's almost no portfolio effect. So it's really expensive to, believe me, both of us know this, it's really expensive to invest in a bunch of games at once. Like, if you actually want to financially back four or five titles and you want to be, have a meaningful relationship with the team, you know, and that's a, let's say, one to eight million dollar commitment across those titles to actually add to their engineering budget, maybe let them hire one more, you know, cool person from another studio or, you know, that full stack person they really need or the database person they need to do the architecture so the online stuff actually works. I mean, we've all been in those meetings where it's like, oh, we just need this one more guy, right? Well, how much is that guy? Well, he's 200 grand, right? And we end up 200 grand. And that's a real issue. Um, so I, I think with film, you're starting to see it. I mean, you have Magnolia and other people who you can invest in Magnolia, and now you're invested in 20 in indie films, right? But there's nobody like that in gaming. You still have to sort of do these one-off deals. It's really expensive. You have to fly somewhere and have one meeting with a guy, and it doesn't work out, and now you just burned an afternoon. Um, well, I argue because I have a fun like that. Well, right? okay, yeah, right? fair, fair. There are fair. some people doing that, but it's fair. Weird. Yeah. And well, and I think one of the issues, I mean, there are a few, there are a few funds that let you, and there are a few broader entertainment yeah. funds as well, um, but they aren't, like, you aren't pulling in mass market investment yet is part of the issue. Like, you know, Hollywood, like, people understand what a movie is, people understand that it takes two years and then you have a movie and it either does well or it doesn't. Games, people still don't quite understand how it works. People don't understand how project level funding works. People don't understand why are these engineers so expensive? Like, there isn't very good literacy around, which is crazy to me, right? People can understand why, like, some teenage actor costs $5 million to put in a movie, but you can't understand why, like, engineer dude needs to get his WRX fixed. Like, <laughs> one, that seems pretty straightforward. But. So <clears throat> when it comes to, to factors like this, like cost, um, one of the trends that I've seen personally, uh, for, especially from some of the bigger VCs, is a greater reluctance to invest in actual game studios because they're concerned that they can't pick the winners and the losers in terms of the actual titles that are going to get released. So instead, they prefer to invest in tools companies or something where they think the technology can really be reused effectively. Uh, Carl, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I love reusable stuff. I mean, this is like a huge theme and stuff I invest in, like uh, Skyship, the company here in Madison that I'm an investor in, actually in Stoughton, Wisconsin. Um, you know, they spent six months and a lot of money building what is the best card deck mechanic for shuffling, showing hands of cards, showing table activity, player-to-player uh, -player and player-to-dealer interaction getting all that stuff working perfectly, getting the animation beautiful. Now they can take any art, put it on those cards. You know, they license a card game within a week. They can have all the art imported and have it working properly. Um, you know, we've talked about some of these other investments. Um, and even the big studios have realized, like, they need these tools from other people. Uh, the partnership between I.O. and Autodesk last year is a great example. You know, they were already using AutoCAD, but why not work directly with Autodesk, have a version of Autodesk for building game environments? Um, you know, and there are certain things in a game environment that Autodesk normally doesn't deal well with, like walls that have zero width, right? Like, um, so doing those things, I think, is really important. And as to your question of, like, is it investor timidness? I don't know. Obviously, we need investment at all layers of the industry. We need investment in the people making the tools and the people making the games. Um, 
but I, I think the investment's going to be out there. I mean, once you invest in the tools and enough people are using those tools to make games, then people are going to be like, oh, and the return on a top title is a lot higher than buying Autodesk stock. Anna, your thoughts? Is that a factor for you, Paul? Or yeah, what? I mean, I mean, tons of tools. I mean, obviously, no Unity. That's yeah, pretty, right. Yeah, it's yeah. a pretty good one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, so, um, no, I mean, we were definitely on stuff like, you know, optimization engines to, yeah, like, you know, people using tools to sure. create assets and games and stuff like that. Um, you definitely do both, though. You've kind of always done both. You know? I do everything. <laughs> you yeah, do everything. But, I but there's been a... Of a in Africa. Right. I mean, like, <clears> I mean um, you're not like the Andreessen Horowitzes who are saying no, we only no, do... No, but I'm saying, a lot of these guys co-invest with us, and they do more on the kind of tools. Okay. The, you know, the, they say the, the pickaxes. Sure. Tools and the thing, right? And the problem also a lot of times with game companies, you guys go to Silicon Valley, a lot of times game guys are like, we're going to make a cool game. And like, it's like, okay, we actually believe you might actually build that game. But people aren't thinking holistically, how do I build up? And how do I, again, that's why these guys like the Zing and stuff, yeah, they, they're not the coolest game companies maybe on the world, but you know what, they built a company and they had a vision for a company from day one, right? So I think a lot of errors a lot of game guys make is like, they're so into the game, they don't think about building a company, right? It's not that's about why a lot of guys in Valor turned off, they're like, yeah, 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 cool, right? Um, so it's like, that's, I think, a big major, major factor for both of you. Know, the other thing I'd add on that is like, you don't have to build everything. There's a huge misperception that, like, to be a real game company, you have to build everything. Like, there's really good off-the-shelf stuff in almost every... There's good off-the-shelf NPC AI now. There's good off-the-shelf... Like, there's cool stuff out there that you do not need to build. And using that stuff wisely lets you put engineers on the stuff that you do need to build. Fantastic. So when it comes to, like, more mature companies, that are, that are looking for, for um, growth, basically, for investment, for, well, everything from uh, paid user acquisition is a huge one for the mobile industry or developing their next title or whatever. Uh, beyond kind of the team space, when you're looking at business models and analytics, product history, and that kind of thing, what are you guys looking for uh, when you're looking at like a mid-sized company that's looking for an additional round or some such? Paul, you want to jump into that? I mean, yeah, once it gets larger, then you're looking at metrics, right? Like, so let's say they're a free-to-play game, right? And, they launched in Australia and Canada, and it's doing really good. Yeah, then it's way easier to you know, go out there and raise the money, you know, buy advertising and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, if it's not a company like that, but uh, the company's progressing pretty well and getting more, I wouldn't say console, but just whatever, like they're not doing some super tons of metrics, then the VCs are looking at like, you know, how's this thing being built out? Like, how are, you, you know, how are you filling your gaps? Are you going out there and building people and complimenting you? Are you actually thinking about launching another studio in another city? Are you guys, you know, think about acquiring some people, right? And so they're looking more at this holistic picture of the thing, right? But yeah, I mean, if you have metrics, then it's, you know, and the metrics look good, it's really easy, right? Or you fucking kill the game and try another one as quickly as possible. Yeah. Right. We, we look at IP as a big indicator in the space, whether people are serious about doing the next big thing. Um, I mean, if you're able to do a collaboration with a studio bigger than you are, you're able to license some material, whether it's a character or a film or a sports franchise or whatever space you're in, you know, the fact that you were able to do that deal shows me something about the maturity of the organization, the fact that you have decent legal advisors, that you're able to do a licensing deal, that you're able to, you know, put a percentage of sales on the table. You have the confidence to do that. Um, so th those things all matter. Um, I would say it's maturity metrics at that point. Like, do you actually have, okay, you've reached revenue. Do you actually have the team that can run a company? It's more about uh, whether you're grown up as a company, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. I mean, if you look at, like, a great example, you want to talk growth stage, like, if you want to talk about the three generations, and I have a bias because I was at Microsoft Ventures during this period, but... Um, you look at the three stages of Bungie as a game company, from University of Chicago dorm room to pre-launch Halo to Destiny, those are like three different companies. Totally unrelated, like, and Alex's level of involvement's different, and the size of the Eng team's radically different, whatever. So like thinking about how other companies grow can help you think about, okay, what's a reasonable trajectory for at the stage I'm at, in year three, with four engineers, you know, what's kind of reasonable, you know? And maybe you aren't, you know, 
I don't know, there are lots of bad cases to pay attention to, too. I mean, whatever. God help you if you're, you know, circa 2017 Activision, three bankruptcies later, like, it's insanity. Yeah. Really poorly run company. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the other things that's been popping in the news lately is uh, investments in esports franchises. Like I saw there was a, an esports team that actually went out for an A round and had people like, Elon Musk's brother investing in it. And I'm rocket like, system. <laughs> I, Second best Rocket League team in the world. <laughs> All right. So, Carl, uh, lead us off on that. What do you think about the whole uh, the whole esports investment thing and where it's going to take us and potentially uh, what what game studios should be doing to, to help act on that? This is not my area, but it's an area that some people believe in, like, religiously. And it's a shame we don't have somebody on the panel who's like, I will, I will say one thing, which is Raul Sood had every fucking career opportunity you can imagine left as CEO of Microsoft Ventures to start an esports company um, and put 20, 30 million of his own money into it. Um, and there's other stuff on the esports front that I don't think people are paying attention to from an investment standpoint. We're actually taking a pitch next week from a company that I play a game with you, and then I play a game with you, and they import all my stats, and they start making odds. So next time we play, I get like four and one odds that I'm going to beat you at this game. And they handle the clearing and the treasury function, and they hold, you know, they have a casino license. Um, so, you know, there's wow. that side of it. Yeah, yeah, the betting. And then there's the intersection between like real sports and esports, which I think is really interesting. Um, and then I think there's a discussion around where, like, how much of the AR, how much of the AR VR space is going to be esports oriented, as far as, you know, and it's already starting with like walkthroughs, and showing people what it's like to play this game at a really high level, and whatever. And I think you're going to see more of that. You're going to see like aspirational gaming around esports. Like, I want to play at the level this guy does, you know, whatever. Maybe I pay a hundred bucks for like some mega tutorial AR thing to teach me how to do that or whatever. I mean, I get why some people get upset about esports, right? I mean, you see some of the attendance numbers in these events, and then people just start thinking Super Bowl, oh shit, or World Cup, right? And so they just start making the equivalent. Okay, esports <clears throat> is like what the NFL, or let's say the NBA was in the seventies. Oh shit, if you owned an NBA team, you're say you're Jerry Buss, you bought the Lakers for a couple, like a couple million dollars. Mm. The 70s, yeah, it's worth billions of dollars. People are thinking like that, right? So I think they're kind of making that equivalent, and that helps them make that leap, right? And so they get sports, and they get the media and the rights around it. They get the fandom. They get uh, creating stars out of these people. And so they're like, okay, cool. I get that. I don't get the game. I don't get the underlying stuff, but I can get all the media stuff and all the attendance around it. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot of people pump up about esports. I've been pretty neutral about it. I know some investors kind of just speak as I knew the people. I around it necessarily. But um, yeah, I think that's why people are you see a lot of money coming into it. I think you'll see more money coming in for the next year or two. And then people cool off again. It'll be cyclical and they'll be like, oh shit, where are we gonna get all this money? And they'll have to kind of claw under. But I think it's here to stay, right? I mean, what do you think about it? what is somebody who's really amazing at a video game? Well they're a fucking athlete, right? They're just a mental athlete, right? Some guys can go out there and get totally jacked, work 15 years of his life, you know, training his physical body, his you know, upper body, lower body. And this guy's can go out there and and his other uh, you know, skill set. So I think in that way, it's uh, you know, a pretty major thing that they're actually highlighting people for the different skills that they have. One thing I think is really interesting is almost none of the big esports activity has to do with sports games. No, of course not. I think yeah. they have some a yeah. little bit, right? Um, but yeah, for the most part, no. But like, nobody knows who the top Madden player is. <laughs> but everybody knows that Twin Hoisong, or whatever that guy's name is, is the top StarCraft player. Like, it's crazy that there's this, it's crazy which games build a sports culture around yeah, them. Yeah, of course. And I mean, also, a lot of people look at Korea, right? Yeah. And they see what happened there, and they're trying to extrapolate from it. Like, okay, they're like 10 year leading edge ahead of us. Okay, it's going to happen, right? And that's probably right. So if you extrapolate a country, it's 50 million people, and it's okay, we tie it to the United States, tie it to all of Western Europe. No, 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 no. Okay, it's a big number star right now, but it applies to China. Oh, fuck, right? So, yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, it's, it's funny how the, uh, the 
games that replicate sports that we all grew up with are <laughs> kind of one category, but they're not re considered what's the most difficult or the most challenging to play from an electronic standpoint, so that kind of makes sense. So, uh, Paul, in your, uh, in your answer there, you were talking a little bit about the cyclical nature of investment, how things get super hot for a little while, the, especially in the Bay Area, they climb and spike, and everybody's pumping tons of money into them. And then if nobody really gets any huge exits out that continues to keep them really excited, then things kind of crash and burn. And I've definitely, you know, through the 20 years of running my company, seen plenty of those. And for a lot of game companies, there's a lot of value to being like, well, even like CCP, for instance, right? They've been around for a long time, as long as we have, practically. And they got really big into the VR thing, and then they went out and did a whole big fundraising round specifically around VR when VR was hot. But it's very difficult to do this if you're off peak timing wise, right? So it's like a lot of game companies can't really take advantage of this. So, I mean, VR is pretty much on the downslope at this point. AR is probably past crest as well. But do you, uh, like, what are, what are your thoughts on this and uh, an advice for a game company that's like looking to raise money that's not at the peak moment for some particular type of technology or, you know, whether or not these types of technologies are really necessary for fundraising. Yeah, I mean, your job is considerably harder, right? Yeah. Um, what the cool thing about these peaks is that you can build a bigger vision, right? And one of the big pitches is like, hey, this platform's gonna be huge, and if we come in early, we can define a platform, right? And actually, a lot of the really big game companies started off with that, right? They were either on the Facebook wave, or the free-to-play wave, or before that, you know, whenever like a big console came out, they fit up that way, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, history itself actually does lend to those peaks doing pretty well. The question is, you know, um, AR, I still think you can raise some money off of it. Hmm. If you were to make a compelling enough story, yes. Uh, VR, very hard. Well, if you're a new studio, no fucking way. Um, yeah, esports, there's still some lights. Maybe if you kind of, if you have a good team, you can kind of say something. But um, yeah, I mean, if you're not at the peak time, then you gotta grind really fucking hard, right? And there's many routes, right? You go to the indie route, you stick around for a couple of years, build your, and then you raise money when the next minute does come, or when your your game does really well, right? Um, and you look. Sometimes you don't have to raise money, right? I mean, being independent is awesome too, right? And I've seen people build huge companies, right? It's a little bit harder initially, um, but it's very rewarding too, right? I mean, you have three, a big three, but no one can tell you what the fuck to do. Um, but yeah, and then besides that, I mean, yeah, if you really need the money and you're fairly, and you have to grind hard, right? You have to fucking, you know, put, you know, feet in the pavement. You have to go out there, take any random meeting. You have to talk to people like crazy. And you have to build up relationships and keep on prodding. Another big thing is, one thing people really fucking suck at, following up. They'll talk to other people, but they only follow like three. No, you gotta keep on bugging people, right? They have to know that you exist. You send them newsletters, like, send them updates, like, and then, you know, sometimes you break through, right? I mean, I know one of my companies, my second company, um, we talked to 100 plus people, investors, and you know, we finally made some money, right? And we finally got some money, right? Like, if the first, like, 80, 90 people I talked to, no one gave a shit, right? So, like, if you just consistently talk to more and more people, right, if you desperately need it, Yeah, I think people should tease in the investment community a lot harder. People wait way too long to hype what they're working on. Uh, there's this instinct, I think, especially in the game industry, that it has to be like a Hollywood trailer level demo before you can show it to anybody. And A, that's just not true. And B, um, like investors are in part investors because they have some imagination about what your company could become. So give them some credit and say like, hey, this is what I'm working on. Here's the concept art. Here's the game flow. Here's the storyline. Here's kind of, you know, here's the demographic we're going to appeal to. And let them kind of infer how those pieces fit together. Because if you wait, like you can polish forever and you will run out of money. It doesn't matter how much money you start with. Polishing software is super expensive. So get it to good enough. Take three people you trust, invite them over for drinks, ask them if it's good enough, and then start showing it to investors, is, is my view. Yeah, to start relationships early. You might Definitely. say no initially, but you might change your mind, or you might blow more than a second or week. At least you've made contact with somebody yeah. at that point. Yeah, definitely. Or tell people when you aren't taking money. That always gets my attention. <laughs> if, if somebody <laughs> says, you know, we, we aren't taking money right now, or we're just working on this, we want to get it to a better stage, I'm like, huh, not taking money right now, okay. I make a little <laughs> mental note. 
you know. A little I, reverse psychology there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it works, it works, yes. <laughs> very exclusive. <laughs> I, I run into very few people who are not taking money, so I, I remember almost all of them. <laughs> Oh, mental experience. note, yeah, like everybody in the room is going to be like, so we're not taking money, Carl. Right, yeah. Very cool, very cool. So, uh, Carl, do you have any advice for companies uh, to watch out for, like, I don't know, there have been uh, some concerns that people have, have told me about where when it comes to, like, terms and term sheets that are a little bit scary, or there's the recent evolution towards uh, anti-dilution terms, like uh, full ratcheting and, and various exit option yeah, I, models for early investors. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, this whole idea of like a persistent, some kind of persistent preferred agreement, I, I would just say no out of the box. I mean, you're, you're locking up a chunk of your cap table that you're never going to get back. You're going to have to dilute out your awesome engineer guy that you hired on day one, but you don't get to dilute out this VC whose money ran out a year ago um, it's just, it's crazy to me that people are taking terms like that. I'm, so, I'm so just, fine. Just to recap real quick yeah. what, the, what these terms kind of mean. I mean, basically, it's the notion that somebody can invest money in your company, and then when another round comes in, they're not losing their equity relative to the next round. Yeah, I'm fine with, I'm fine with giving people some kind of pro rata right where they can re-up, give me some more money, and keep a position. I think that's fine, and that's totally appropriate. And I'm even fine, if it's a make or break investment, I'm fine protecting that person for the next equity round. But I, uh, so extreme example, but my former housemate um, was on like one of the, kind of the original team at Acquia in Boston. They just raised a series G last year. And they have an investor chilling on their cap table from their series B who, basically has had to put in a minimal amount of money to get a free ride for eight years while this company has done series, series G. G. Oh, fuck. Okay. And I'm like, I'm like, you should not allow people like that. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing that I'm seeing more of, and this is a movies and games thing, is like some crazy convertible rights on debt agreements, which, I mean, read that stuff, because, I mean, you should not be taking, people are like, oh, look at this. I get this note, and like the interest rate's low, and I get some money. Well, it's like, yeah, but like the, convert, the, the conversion is insane. That person can end up owning 10% of your company for giving you, you know, four or five months of runtime. And that's like, I mean, if you really need that runway, maybe you should negotiate that. But like realize that those are predatory terms. Paul, do you have any uh, advice that you give to? I mean, if I see stuff, I just run away. Yeah. If I'm an investor, I see a shit. I'm like, okay, come back to me when you're back. If you don't, then goodbye. Yeah. Yeah. Why should I put the effort? Why should I let that guy have a free ride? I don't care. Yeah, there's, an, there's more investable companies out there. All right, it's way too much stress for me. Has I, it become more common in the valley? I mean, are you starting to see more and more no, like? I see the valley's going business. opposite. Become more founder-friendly terms over the last. I agree. Really? Okay. Um, you have stuff like the safes and the convertible notes are very clean, right? So I mean, stuff is templatized, right? Yeah, you yeah. go out there, Series C, boom, done, right? You change your name, you do some shit, you go and get corporate for five hundred dollars, right? Yeah. Um, so no, I think it's getting better. Okay. Right? All right. I, All the stuff that I had seen about the full ratchet stuff was within the last. I don't five know where years. you fucking found those people. Like those must okay. be really fucking shark assholes. If you got like, a real investment in Valley, they probably wouldn't do that. All right. Better, yeah. Fantastic. Well, that's that's great to no, hear. Because has been way better. Because they know the best interest comes later, right? And so you're giving out shit terms. One, you're gonna lose the deal. Two, word spreads pretty quickly. Oh, this guy's gonna fucking. Sleep. Nobody wants him to be on the cap table with them. No, well, <laughs> not, I mean, you get like, yeah, there's some people like I'm involved on boards, and they come up just like, hey, you guys, whatever. So you're like, oh my god, this guy is a fucking shark. And it was a desperate time, all right? But like, yeah, if you can avoid him. Yeah, the worst deals I see, and this is film and entertainment and gaming, the worst terms I see are so-called like third-tier incubators, <laughs> right? Like, oh, come have some free office space and yeah. we'll take a bite out of your company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, no, do not do that. Huh. 
So moral of the story, if you get a term sheet, read it really, really well, and if you know somebody who knows about investment, you know, talk to them about it and, and the like, because uh, it can be a little hairy and, uh, yeah. If you talk to those 100 people, you're, you may see one that's a little weird. Exactly, well, maybe you will, for sure, right? <laughs> but also, you get a term sheet, that's a great sign. That's a great sign. You yeah. shut that around, right? Yeah, yeah. may excite everybody else. Uh, so, freak out. They're like, oh my god, you got a term sheet? Oh fuck, maybe I missed something. By the way, we have one at Northwestern. Almost all law schools have some kind of entrepreneurial support clinic professor who's done VC work, whatever. Grab an hour of that person's time. I mean, if you're going to bet the company on a legal document, you know, get get a real opinion from somebody who's done this a hundred times. Definitely, definitely. All righty. Uh, so, Carl, you're. Uh starting to delve into some uh, recapitalization prospects, I think, with, uh, with IO. Do you want to talk about that a little bit and what that uh, kind of looks like with a larger company? Yeah, we're, well, we sent them a proposal. We'll, we'll see, uh, we're a little past that now, I guess. Um, IO is like a really interesting shop and I believe in them and I'm not a current investor. Uh, we offered, put together a group of people, offered them a couple million dollars to do a substantial restructuring um, and uh, we announced this last week. I, I think it's, I think it's interesting when you have a studio with a lot of assets but a really thin pipeline. Because um, on one side you can get creative. There's a lot of lot you can do from the project side. Um, on the other side, it's like from the product side, you've got nothing on the shelf right now, right? And that's really scary. So, you know, I always tr had to get really creative, right? The, Every time they run out of development budget, they make a shitty Hitman movie, and they get 20% of that revenue, and they try to plow it back into engineering, and they hope not too many of their engineers quit before the movie revenue check clears. Uh, like, that's clearly not sustainable. Um, and they've been really bad at managing partnerships, so they've actually lost control of a lot of IP and characters and other things that people care about when they go buy games. So uh, we think they're ripe for a restructuring, um, and we think, you know, I don't know, I, I don't want to talk numbers, but for less than $50 million, you could do a mop-up and reorganize the stack of assets that you're talking about and really get them on their feet in a meaningful way, rather than having them live on these year-to-year -year budgets where they're just doing whatever they need to do to keep making payroll, which is like not a way to run a company. I don't care if you're a game company or any other kind of company, it's not the way to do it. Interesting, so a lot of challenges that even for a, a well-established franchise. Yeah, I think it's very, a lot of these established companies have that problem where they're kind of like well, year to year, very live project, project. THQ imploding, I mean, there's certainly been <laughs> lots of yeah, for, big For those who don't know the history at IO, I mean, they had a really messy divorce from Square, basically the old Enix side of Square, um, and they, they have been unable financially to recover from that. So, I, I mean, we're one of several groups of investors looking at doing something there, but um, it, it just sucks as a gamer who cares about some of that IP and thinks that some of those franchises are really valuable. Um, it, it's stupid to see that stuff go to waste, and some of that stuff took decades to build. Um, so hopefully, you know, one of these investor groups, hopefully our group, will get to salvage it. As a huge Hitman fan. You, huge Hitman fan. You definitely want that to, to work out. I understand. Totally. Yeah, very, very cool. So uh, to kind of wrap things up, um, and, and I'll go to each of you for this, but uh, Paul, for starters, like, you've worked with a lot of early stage companies. You've been through, obviously, a couple of companies, but you've done a lot of accelerator stuff, a lot of, you know, people who are really bootstrapping. Uh, getting their first product out the door and things like that. Is there any kind of like distilled advice that you would pass along that's a few points just to help somebody uh, get from that first stage of, you know, we've got partial prototype, we've got something that's looking pretty cool, we're looking to take it to market, maybe we're looking at early access, this, that, and the other thing. We're not quite sure how to get enough runway to get there. Um, you know, the, the different options and, and what you think is probably the best way to proceed at this stage of things. Yeah, I mean, a couple things. One, don't be as much of a cockroach as possible. So don't be, you know, spending money we don't need to be as concerned as you can. You know, 
in your way any way you can, right? Don't be too proud, right? Um, two, um, yeah, you know, hit the ground running as in like talk to people, right? Start sharing what it's like. Don't just keep it inside and keep your secret sauce. Do that. You know, like you know, show the rough diamond. Be like, this is what it is, right? And this is where it's gonna go, and have a big vision as to what's going beyond that, right? Um, and besides that, um, I mean, just more kind of company advice. Um, don't hire people just because your feelings become bigger, right? Make sure every person you bring into the company really early is awesome. Um, that's an early part of the whole, you know, process because those people define your company five, ten, twenty years ago. Even if they leave, if somebody kind of you know put it in some place and kind of you know, sets the set the tone early, their their kind of ghost lives on, right? So make sure your early people are awesome and don't overhire if you don't need to, right? Um, because some people get in the trap like, oh my God, I need to look big and do get invested. No, investors have to sit down and yeah, that's some you know some. Creativity to see where you guys will go, right? And if you have a core good, awesome team, that's that's good for strength. Carl, I would say don't don't focus on the release. Everybody's you know, especially if you have a history of working at a big software company, you have this you know just diligence around. Okay, when's the release date? Are we on target? What's the and you can't run small companies that way. It's just it's not how small groups of people interact. Um, Use the community. Don't be inward looking. Don't just, you know, if it's you and your five guys sitting around talking about, oh, we missed another deadline, like that isn't how you're going to get shit done. So, you know, use, I mean, if whether you want to use early prototype stuff, um, I mean, there's some great field feedback, alpha and beta tools through Steam, or you can do play testing on Steam with feedback with isolated populations. Um, there are other tools available, you know, Xbox community SDK, if you're developing on platform, uh, if you're developing on that platform, it's excellent, and you get access to a sub-community of console gamers who will give you feedback. So, you know, you don't have to play test everything with your brother-in-law or whatever, like, there are resources available to tell you if you're on the right track, to tell you if this feels popular, to tell you if it's too buggy to give to real people. Um, Make use of those resources. Most of them are free, because whether it's Steam or Xbox or whoever, they want you. They want more content on their platform, and that they're putting a lot of stuff out there to encourage you to get on their platform. So use it. Exploit what they're giving you. Definitely. Yeah, I've I've even seen uh, some people in the last year or so uh, with relatively decently sized titles doing things like releasing on itch.io which is like this super indie little community, but they don't have to worry about doing an early access release and then getting negative feedback and reviews from the early access release. So they can do basically a public you know, launch, pre-launch, and then get feedback from that before actually pushing something out onto Steam. So lots of reviews, lots of feedback, lots of commentary from an actual playing user there. Or, or launch in a Steam sandbox and link it from a subreddit or link it from a community that where you're known or you know that there are gamers there that you trust their opinion. And I mean, get a couple hundred people. That's that's all you need. Like get get some feedback because the earlier you make those changes, the cheaper they are. If you try to make a radical change three months before a release date, I guarantee you it costs a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of reasons why. Half-Life 1 had to be two games. They made Half-Life, and then they went, oh, this isn't very good, and then they made Half-Life again. <laughs> now, fortunately, Gabe had a lot of money coming from Microsoft. All right, so that kind of wraps up the, uh, the standard panel portion of this, and at this point, uh, we're taking questions for the next 10 minutes or so. So does uh, anybody have any questions? If you want to, like, raise your hand and fire off a question, I'll repeat it into the mic. Anyone? <laughs> Congratulations. That's an absolute truth. But we're a tiny studio, we're kind of bootstrapping. We're, we haven't been showing it, which I, I guess might be kind of issues that we're not taking money, but we are going to be releasing on a console and Mac and PC. But we've been thinking like the right thing to do would be wait until after that before we started talking uh, to people and saying, look, we, this is how we can prove that we are capable of doing this. Does that sound um, like it's, that's going to be coming for free? Does that sound like the time to take a step like that? Or should we wait to see what the critical perception is? Maybe 
So just to recap your question for the, for the benefit of the camera, uh, you're asking whether or not you should kind of start talking to investors potentially prior to release or kind of post-release, yes. more or less? Okay. Yeah, I mean, okay, so there's two times you raise money for a company, right? You have to mention this. One, you raise money on the dream, and two, you raise money on the reality, right? So you're fucking the dream stage right now, right? You might be able to go out there and raise more money, and if your company, the game fails, you're still in good shape, right? If you release your game and it fucking falls flat on its face, you're fucked, right? So it actually might be very good for you to go out there and talk to people. I mean, right now I wouldn't go to 100 VCs or 50, whatever. I'd go to five to 10, you know, really warm intros to your friends and connections. Go out to them and say, hey, I'm building this. This is what's going to happen. You know, have them aware of it. And maybe somebody gets hot and bothered and might put money in, right? Um, or if not, at least now you start building relationships. So if you go back to them and numbers look at decent after the launch, they now have relationships with you. They're like, okay, I met this guy once. And he kept doing his work. It is fucking deadline. And numbers are good. Okay, this guy's good. Normally, put money in only in one meeting, right? So if you do that earlier, that's great. So that's that's how I would approach it. The other thing, and I mean, you have to, you know, keep your ego in your pocket when you're in these meetings, because you're gonna hear shit that you don't want to hear. But like, the reason to talk to VCs now is to get an outside, relatively unbiased opinion of what your company might be worth if this did well, like. I don't care who you are, you know, super honest with yourself, you're really working the numbers, getting a second opinion on how much your company is worth, what that valuation might be with, if you move X number of copies, that's a valuable thing for you to know because it influences how much cash you're going to have if this works out, influences how many people you can hire, influences what kind of resources are realistic for your company next year if you're launching in February. So get an opinion. From, I, I, would, I would say, yeah, go three, three or five people and say, hey, here's the product plan, here's the roadmap, rollout date's February 15th, we're expecting X number of copies sold, here's why, here are some comps, here are similar games, it's freemium, what, whatever model you're on, and see if they think it's realistic. If they're like, no, you know, I, I think at most that's a $3 million company, even if everything goes well, then at least you have that opinion from somebody who has no reason to bullshit you, right? Like, they're looking at you as an investment, they think it's three million, they think the number's one million, five million, great. But get, get the opinion now. Because yeah, if the game fails, now you got way fewer conversations you can have. And they're gonna be much more antagonistic conversations. Go ahead. So to, just to kind of recap, you're, you're considering the, the difference between uh, getting outside investment from a traditional investor or potentially a publisher and the, the trade-offs of that? Is that yeah. kind of what you're looking for feedback for? I mean, it sounds like you're semi in a hard place, right? Um, so I would talk to both, right? I mean, some publishers do put money down, right? I mean, I know some publishers, especially Asians, you know, like uh, in Japan, Korea, China, where they pay you down. Yeah, they do well. I actually have a lot of my companies going to Asia nowadays. I don't send to Silicon Valley, no fucking way. Um, I might send some you know, strategic 
guys on some, like, yeah. I, and these Asian companies, someone will actually do it as a pure financial investment, right? Not a strategic where you, they have to publish you or they have to do it, right? So I would withdraw your conversation. Talk to some publishers in parallel, talk to some investors. Um, and maybe these publishers or these developers might come in as a regular investor, not strategic, right? And you can kind of speed the conversation in that direction. Um, but maybe not, maybe they'll become a really good partner for you, right? But yeah, you, yeah, you can't just throw a game out there anymore, right? That's why other people continue chasing other new platforms, right? You can go to VR, you can go to AR, you can go to fucking, I don't know, holographic, fucking retinal shit, who knows, right? Um, so, yeah, like you're in a space where, yeah, you missed the window a little bit, you probably should have raised money after that first game, did really well, right? You didn't? Cool. Now you can go out to lick your wounds and um, find something that might help you get out of that sprawl of sorts, right? If you're doing okay, but it, it could have done much, you could have tackled a little bit better, right? But you learned, right? I mean, my first company, I put it, I didn't know what the fucking metric capital was, right? You probably should have done it, right? Probably would have been much bigger than it, but we all didn't like that. So. Yeah, I, one thing I would say is a good strategic investor, not a publisher, might have more literacy around who the right publisher for you is and could probably do a better job making that introduction. Um, so, I mean, somebody who's done this before, somebody who's invested in a company that is maybe at a similar stage to your company, who understands the publisher landscape, who understands the trade-offs about going to a, you know, Maybe, maybe the answer is, you know, oh, you know, we aren't going to get a mainstream U.S. publisher, but we're going to get kind of second-tier South Korean publisher, or we're going to, you know, get one of these French infra game whatever publishers, or, you know, get NAS Modi or uh, NDK or somebody like that. Okay, you know, what kind of terms do they offer? What kind of terms are typical for them? Would they do some money up front if you were willing to take you know, different residual terms. Like, what does that look like? Because these guys are flexible. In the end, I mean, they're, a publisher signs lots of different licensing agreements. So, total bullshit if somebody comes to you and says, oh, that's, publisher A only uses contract A, and you have to take terms A. Like, no. You can negotiate with all these guys. So, figure out what's realistic. You did the right thing when you asked the question, right? You led with six million downloads on last title, Blah, blah, like tell that story, right? We did this before, it, it went well. We recognize market environment's different now. We think we can still do well. We need to partner with a strong publisher that's in the channel where we're gonna do well. Here's that channel, here's our target audience. Maybe we can work together. Like that's the right pitch, I think. That you have a, uh, have a background that's proven is really useful. So I think we'll take one more question and I believe you had a question, I'm bringing the mic to you. Uh, hey guys, okay. thanks for doing the panel. I learned a lot and took some really good notes. Um, question on when you guys are evaluating companies that are not necessarily in a strict place like a console environment, let's say you're evaluating game developers that are creating for Steam or app stores, um, do you have an opinion on paid versus free to play with microtransaction in terms of a business model? in the companies that you evaluate is one more or less risky, is everything that's taking place with in-app monetization stuff, is that like changing what the VCs are now considering as a better return in the long run where maybe a $3 per game or $60 per game model is more or less lucrative than, you know, like the Candy Crush model that's making gangbusters dollars a day? I'd agree with that. And, and most VCs, I would say, are pretty platform agnostic. Most VCs really care about user base. So, like, if you can show me a million users, I don't care whether they're on Xbox or Steam or yeah. iOS. Like, sticky, yeah. Back, yeah. yeah, I want to see, like, daily, monthly logins, unique users, time in game. Um, if you have data on, you know, Steam is really good about data on like what else are they playing? 
how much money are they spending? Like, you can get really good data on like, who are these people? That is valuable to a VC. Um, so that's, that's one piece. And I mean, it used to be, I mean, even 10 years ago, it was like, you had to clunk the shit out and cross compile to get onto another platform and whatever. And now, I mean, it's relatively easy to go between these things. I mean, so it, I don't think people care as much about where you are. People care, do you have users and do your users have money? Yeah, I mean, we fucking lovers in a dangerous space time is on Nintendo Switch. And like, I saw that game when it was in beta and it definitely was not designed for Nintendo Switch, right? So like, you can put anything anywhere. The question is, are the users there and can you generate revenue? Fantastic, and I think that's gonna uh, wrap us up for this panel. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and I hope you continue to enjoy the conference. Thanks guys for coming.